this Pride Sunday, may our eagerness be matched by our completing the task. Amen. Maybe you remember these gadgets from the late 60s and early 70s. My dad had one of these little structures on his desk. It was a kind of interactive sculpture with five or six metal steel balls hanging from parallel bars. Picking up one ball, you would knock the side of the other balls, sending a ball on the other end, bouncing back and forth, back and forth bouncing away from its other round metal colleagues, then clack back. Pull back two or three balls and the transfer of energy continued. Back and forth, clack, clack, clack and forth. I remember being mesmerized at what one or two forceful ball drops could do to a whole system, to matter, to time and attention. I was fascinated how one little smack could disrupt so much for so long. And while it would be nearly 16 centuries after the gospel stories took place when Isaac Newton explained the physics of gravity, momentum, and energy transfer, in Jesus' time, metaphorical disruptions by outside forces operated all the same as they do today. Jesus' encounter with the hemorrhaging woman, the sick child, indeed his entire earthly ministry included interventions in forces and systems that comprised the social collisions of his time. Smack, clack, clack. In some of the miracle stories, Jesus' healing seems a lot like a great hand coming down on the metaphorical Newton's cradle to just stop the collisions. Jesus' death was that too. Smack, clack, clack, until Jesus on the cross absorbed the pain and offered an alternative to its evil. By his divine presence, death, and resurrection, the gravitational force that calls us all to peace, the presence of God, was demonstrated. In the more than 2,000 years that have followed, we've tried to make sense of it all. And we continue to do so while watching the forces around and within us repeating the well-worn experiment, spewing hate hurts untold numbers of people. It emboldens some to lash out. This leads to reprisals. Clack, clack, clack. Last week I received an email from someone seeking prayers after having left his native country for fear of living as a gay man, only to spend the next 12 years of his life, as he described it, victimized by the same worries, dangers, and assaults. But now, instead of living with his loving family, he was living under plastic sheeting with strangers in a foreign land. The truth is, though, we don't have to leave the United States to find instances of the same dread and even danger. Since 2016, there has been a rising sense of anxiety, of growing rhetoric and organized action against LGBTQ people, and the reverberating consequences. Today, the ACLU is tracking 523 anti-LGBTQ bills in the United States. The Washington Post reported that in states with laws targeting LGBTQ issues, school hate crimes quadrupled Haters push the school boards, who push the teachers, who push the students, who push the hate. One thing leads to another. This Pride Sunday, when we celebrate the beautiful diversity of humanity, while there is so much joy expressed at being who God made us to be, we are also reminded to be a faithful sanctuary in the wake of ongoing aggression. 
our salvation history and our presence as the church reminds us that evil's half-life is no match for the force of good, for God's endurance with us, for the healing that comes from this life, from the fullness of life we are called to. Our Seniors with Grace book club recently discussed Howard Thurman's book, Jesus and the Disinherited. A theologian and civil rights leader, Thurman's trailblazing book opened pathways for the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s work and the nonviolent civil rights movement. Thurman's work is nothing short of course correcting even today for Christian thinking, teaching, and living. Our group studied Thurman's revelation of the many ways, including African Americans, women, and Jews have been oppressed and shut out by Christianity. And with Pride Month on our minds, we noticed the parallel treatment of LGBTQ plus people. Our group of thoughtful senior citizens considered how responding to hate, fear, and deception, the methods of the oppressor and enemies of the soul, Thurman wrote, was demonstrated in the civil rights movement, in the Black Lives Matter movement, the Women's March, and the Pride movement, in the ongoing call for the dignity of all people. With today's culminating San Francisco Pride celebration, we celebrate in this great city, and let's do celebrate. But let's also witness for those who still cannot live openly as they know themselves to be. And let's commit to working to secure the dignity for all people in the law and in the hearts of all. Grace Cathedral has a long history of welcome and advocacy and representing the life and leadership of the cathedral by and for LGBTQ plus people. We celebrate with joy the truth that God loves all creation. The cathedral's justice work for queer San San Franciscans through our work in the AIDS crisis in the 1980s and 1990s and our work on LGBTQA equality within the Episcopal Church primes us to continue sharing this loving message. A longtime friend of the cathedral, the late Red Orobito, a regular lecturer at services, an artist and poet and activist who referred to himself in his writing as trans man, Red wrote about his surprise at the affirming experience of being seen and accepted as who he was. In a short passage in one of his books describing his anticipation of the day trans man went to court to have his gender and name legally corrected. Red's prose rang out at first with the sharp hurt of someone used to being dismissed or trampled on, but someone who was determined to have his identity acknowledged and affirmed. Red began the story bitterly, anticipating that he would be required to proclaim his birth name. He'd have to say it aloud in court one more time before he could rescind it forever. Reflecting that he hadn't said that name aloud for 46 years, he decided he wasn't about to do it just for some judge. Red felt as though no one was safe for him at that moment. So painful had his journey been. Walking past the bailiff, Red seethed with certainty that the bailiff was mocking him. If they had to hear that dumb name, Red decided, he would spell it out, letter by letter, first, middle, last. And the moment came. Red stood before the court. Mr. Arobito, the judge declared, you are here for a gender and name change. The reader catches her breath in suspense as Red affirms this statement. Petition granted. Elated, he exits, but no sooner has Red left the courtroom and burst down the hall than he realizes he's forgotten something. Most unpleasantly, he realizes he'll have to go back and deal with the bailiff, whom he's decided he despises. Skulking back into the courtroom, defenses at the ready, he retrieved his things and headed for the door, briefly stunned 
when the bailiff stood and waved an arm at him. Good luck, boss, the bailiff called out. Red wrote that his first impulse on leaving the courthouse was to go to church. Before heading to the chapel, though, he described turning his face to the heavens and saying aloud, do you know how hard that was? I think God does know. God sees the constant bombardment, the diminishment and reprisals that play out over and over, back and forth between people. Jesus lived it, and God holds it. I guess you cannot go on sitting on the fence forever, read Arobito wrote, to not hate, but worse, to not love also. What will our role be going forward? How might we work to not hate, but also to love, to raise the dignity of all people? Just as Jesus healed the hemorrhaging woman and the child presumed dead, how are we called today to respond to the hemorrhaging intolerance of these times? The pushback against people like us, dear to us, but also the intolerance in our own hearts, minds, and actions. We will need God's help with us, and we can have it by grabbing hold of God's offer and carrying that force of good with us. We gather together at this table for sustenance, and this is what we need to respond to the forces of the world. With it, and importantly, together, we can have a lasting impact on the systems and people around us, drawn from the greatest force available the force of God's grace. In the words of Meister Eckhart, some people think that the purpose of life is to find rest. But I say this, if your heart is grounded in God, you'll never be content with being at rest. This sounds like the kind of momentum toward good that is grounded in God a connection through which we will find what we need to respond to the times with a force greater than even the laws of physics. We will respond with the law of love. As the Book of Common Prayer offers, we pray, O oh God, you have bound us together in a common life. Help us in the midst of our struggles for justice and truth to confront one another without hatred or bitterness, and to work together with mutual forbearance and respect. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen, and happy, happy pride.